Yeah, so these are actually chocolates. <laughs> in the box, there are chocolates. The wrappers are what you want, but the chocolate is just a bribe so that you like me, basically. <laughs> um, so if, as the quality street goes around, if you could take some tissue paper of a colour, or two or three colours that you like, and uh, two or three sweets, if we run out of sweets, I have another box. And in your envelope, you should have a piece of white card and a little bit of a framework that some of you may recognise as something like the Iron Bridge. Okay, so while that starts going round, <laughs> I'll, um, I'll introduce myself. Um, my name is Coralie Atchison, and as Hilary said, I'm a heritage consultant at Arup, and I recently completed a PhD on um, the communication of world heritage values to tourists in Ironbridge, which um, in the case of Ironbridge is an industrial world heritage site and its values um, and its world heritage values are to do with its history as uh, one of uh, the very important early sites in the development of the Industrial Revolution and in terms of its monuments which are the Iron Bridge and the Old Furnace as well as the cultural landscape of the gorge. And I realised as I was on the train down here, I barely mentioned industrial heritage in this paper. And <laughs> I think it very much feels like something that is so run through everything that I, I sort of forgot to mention it. So I'm going to try and drop some more industrial heritage into this. But the work is all on industrial heritage, so hopefully that will come through. So, <laughs> how are the sweets going around? Getting there. Um, so the idea behind this is to um, keep you entertained on a Wednesday afternoon, um, obviously, uh, but also uh, to uh, get us thinking about um, some of the different um, ways in which when we use different methods and different methodologies, um, they not only provide us with new data, but they can provide us with new perspectives on uh, the work that we're doing. Um, and also, this is literally something that came up from some of the ethnographic work that I did. Um, I found myself making a collage um, <laughs> at, uh, at an art day focused around the Iron Bridge and mixed media. So I'll come back to that. Um, but yeah, I'm just looking at how far they've gone. Um, nearly there. If you need anything, wave. This can be quite informal. I'll come and like give you more sweets and more paper. Um, at the end, we have questions and then there is a tea break. Um, I have glue, so if you want to come and find me at the tea break or after five, if you're not going to the Jeff Egan Memorial Lecture, um, we can stick your collages down or you can put them all back in your envelope and take them home with you. So as I said at the top, um, the question that I was researching was how um, are the World Heritage Values of Ironbridge Gorge communicated to tourists? So there were three key aspects I was looking at. Um, there was tourism, there was heritage, and there was values. Um, methodologically, this was quite a challenge. Um, so I needed an approach which could bring together the temporality and the temporariness of tourism. We've got people who are only um, at this site for um, a few hours. Um, but also, they're there through different parts of the year. Um, their days, uh, you know, their, their mornings might be different to their afternoons. So there's, there's all kinds of um, temporal aspects to get into. Um, there's also a huge amount of individuality. So tourists are not one faceless mass of people. They are uh, from all different countries and all different social and educational backgrounds and all different interests. And maybe they're there as a group, or maybe they're there on their own, and all of these things can affect their experience and engagement with the story of the site. Um, and also Ironbridge as a destination, as a cultural landscape, as an industrial heritage site, has different kind of um, spatial dynamics, uh, all of which can be affected by all of those other things that I've mentioned. So it was quite complex to try and think about how to approach it methodologically. Um, especially as the core of the research was looking at something that is inherently intangible, and that's the value of heritage. Um, so I tried a lot of different things, and it was quite messy. Um, so this lovely, quite neat slide reflects 
a lot of scrabbling around trying to work out how to even start with this problem. And there was a lot of trial and error. And so what I would like to try and um, present today is uh, uh, some personal reflections on a lot of the benefits of working in interdisciplinary ways and a lot of the challenges. Um, and also um, trying to add a little bit more, because um, it is tag, thinking about what it means when we mix these different disciplines together. So the first, uh, and they, these are not ordered in any kind of weighting, but the first of the four main um, areas I used um, was ethnography. And I uh, really enjoyed um, watching Hannah's um, presentation now, very similar approach to kind of present the different lenses. Um, so it's very similar, but thankfully um, with quite different disciplines, which really shows the variety of ways in which we can approach the subjects and where we can go with them. Um, so ethnography was probably one of the principal um, methods and methodologies that I used. And what's really interesting is when you um, think, well, I probably need to interview some people. Uh, you need to figure out how to do that, but also you need to understand all the ethical issues or the philosophical issues that are involved with um, a discipline that you have no familiarity with. And that is really fundamentally one of the major challenges, but also benefits of working in an interdisciplinary way. Um, and it would be lovely to maybe discuss some of that um, later on. Um, I, uh, as you can see, this was a painting that I created on this artistic day. Um, it was called the Iron Bridge and Mixed Media. There was collage. This is a combination of acrylic paint and pastel. Um, and it was lovely, you know. Uh, we, we went around the gorge with an artist. She got us to create lots of little sketches of the monuments and then go back and create art from it. Um, but the reason I was doing that was part of the participant observation of tourism that I was doing, which in many ways looked quite fun. I, you know, ate ice cream and went on boat trips and tried to justify that it was research. It really was, obviously. It's very hard. Um, but um, I also interviewed, um, I did long interviews with people involved in tourism in the gorge. Um, from tour guides and cafe owners to the marketing manager for all the 10 museums that operate there, the council's um, tourism team. And I followed this with shorter interviews with tourists themselves. So I interviewed um, just over 200 groups of tourists across the main tourist season from May to September. Um, and I carried out these interviews either at the place of work for the people working in tourism, um, or um, in the places of tourist visitation, um, which is where one of the other lenses will come in because I had to figure out where to interview people. And so I'll come back to that in a moment. But the places that I did interview people were uh, the Iron Bridge, um, the Old Furnace, so the two kind of monumental focuses of this industrial landscape, um, an exhibition in one of the museums, and um, also at the end of a walking trail. I did a lot of um, remote observation, so as well as participant observation where I got to be a tourist. I also did a lot of sitting on benches and just watching what people did for weeks. Um, thankfully the weather was quite good in 2017. Um, and as I say, participant observation. This really was, I think, the most challenging part of the whole uh, project. Um, I'm relatively shy and it's very difficult to just walk up to people and ask if you can interview them. Um, it's even harder sometimes to email people or call them and ask if you can do a longer form interview with them. There's lots of ethical issues. Um, you have to figure out how do I get informed consent. Um, and I was rubbish at it. I asked my supervisor uh, if I could have any training in interviewing and he recommended some books. <laughs> and that was really not very helpful. Um, and I, I found myself reflecting a few months in that the people I was interviewing were getting a lot more interesting. And I realised that I was getting better at asking the questions. So it's not something that you can necessarily just pick up. And I would hardly say that I mastered it in the um, year that I carried out my fieldwork. So the next element I want to look at is digital. 
Um, on the screen, I've got um, some parts of a geocache, and I don't have an Iron Bridge specific one, but for any of you who like Pokemon, um, Pokemon Go was a really big thing in 2017 when I was doing the work. Um, for me, it still is, obviously. <laughs> but um, yeah, not everyone is interested in heritage, uh, especially when there are far more interesting Pokemon. <laughs> um, but whether it's Pokemon or Twitter or Instagram or your train booking app or the um, email that you sent to the hotel company um, or the phone, the camera on your phone, our digital and um, real life lives are completely <coughs> in uh, intermeshed. There's no way that we can separate them. And if we're looking at how people are engaging with an industrial heritage or any kind of heritage, this is going to be um, a factor that we need to look at. Um, I collected a year of tourist produced data. So this is photographs on Instagram. Uh, reviews on TripAdvisor, blogs, Twitter, posts, and so on. Um, and I also collected a huge amount of materials that were created for tourists that are in a kind of virtual space. So um, museum websites, uh, tourism websites, the about, about the area information on hotel sites, that kind of thing. Um, and I also play Pokemon Go. Uh, if you play Pokemon Go and you know Iron Bridge, uh, you'll be interested to know that Thomas Telford built the Iron Bridge. It's not true. Um, but uh, that's one of the really interesting things is that industrial heritage people were not involved in the creation of the data in these apps. You know, they're, they're entirely crowdsourced. Um, and I also did some geocaching, as you can see. When we're working with digital materials. There are a lot of really challenging issues if we do not have the training in them. Um, there are enormous ethical issues. There are really challenging technical issues and skill shortages. Uh, when thinking about that, my skills were definitely short. I had no real sense of how to go about scraping information off the internet, that is the term I believe, I still don't know, I ended up doing it manually, um, which is incredibly labour intensive to just literally read all of the information and copy it into a Word document and yeah, um, that took literally weeks. Um, what I ended up having to do was to continually make the size of the amount of data I was looking at smaller. So I started thinking, oh, I'll just collect all of the Instagram posts related to Ironbridge Gorge. And then I realized very rapidly that that would be far greater than I could ever possibly comprehend. And that's why I ended up looking at this sort of one year that paralleled the collection of interview data. Um, but as you clean your data, you then introduce lots of new questions about its objectivity and um, how you tell people exactly what you've done when you're not entirely <laughs> sure how you've managed to do it. And how do you know that you haven't missed stuff because you used one type of hashtag and not another? Um, these are all complex issues and there is a really, really good paper by Lorna Richardson that came out last week in the Journal of um, Computer Applications in Archaeology, which is far more detailed than anything I'm going to go into now and she is much more of an expert on it than me. Um, but it's all about um, how, what the challenges and methodological pitfalls are in using social media research in archaeology. So if you're interested in this, that is well worth looking at. So we've touched on historical geography. I used um, the more standard form of it. My supervisor was a geographer, and I, uh, my father is also a geographer, and I had to try and figure out um, really how to be a geographer quite quickly because um, it was really fundamental to addressing this kind of research. Tourism is a geographical subject matter. S landscapes are ge geographer, you know. Anyway, um, there is a huge amount of similarity in terms of the uh, philosophical movements in geography and archaeology, um, which is really interesting. And so sort of discovering that this whole field of qualitative geography that, and this kind of rival field of quantitative geography that we can really see in our own profession. Um, 
And one of the issues, and um, this is kind of thing I'm touching on, is that we can't just pick out the methods in um, another field. You have to really try and understand the entire breadth of where those methods have come from. Um, it's not a kind of plug and play uh, approach, and that is really challenging if you don't have the time. So, what's lovely with kind of PhD context is you, you're supposed to kind of spend about a year reading, so I was able to do that, but it's not necessarily a luxury that people have if they're just starting on a project. Um, I won't go into the results really, but um, the geographical side of the research was really about figuring out how to map the different places and spaces within Ironbridge and working out um, how they were differentiated from each other and how people moved between them and in them and what they did in them. And that then fed into where I did the interviews and did more remote observation. Because obviously when you're doing research on your own, you can only be in one place at a time. So you can't observe people in five different places in the same week in the summer holidays. You've got to kind of pick different places to be. The last lens is archaeology. And I was reflecting on this as I was writing it, and I realized I don't really know if I needed to use archaeology in this project. But as an archaeologist, I felt that, that was the only thing I really had to bring to the project. <laughs> and when you feel quite lost in something, it's really comforting to do something that you understand. So I collected a lot of material culture, effectively, around tourism in Ironbridge, sort of kind of contemporary archaeology, from packaging, um, sort of, this is graffiti, says ACDC, um, it's no longer there, thanks to the heritage. Um, they didn't think that this was part of the story of the bridge, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> The love locks also removed very rapidly as soon as they appear. Um, and all these kind of traces of people's engagement with the place and also the way that tourists are encountering the place through their material, um, the material things that they are sold or pick up on their way, um, added a whole different lens to the observations and interviews. So that was really helpful as well. So how does this all stick together? Um, probably for more practical reasons than uh, philosophic ones, I did not give you any glue. Um, <laughs> but obviously if you're making collage, it's just little bits of paper, uh, unless you have something to stick it all together. And um, one of the things you really need to figure out, uh, this is all my reflections on my own stuff, by the way, I'm not saying you have to, sorry, um, is how on earth do you interpret all of this different stuff when you've collected it through different methodologies and you're all really confused. Um, and um, one of the things I thankfully fell into quite early on was a methodological framework called grounded theory methods, which um, allows you to use lots of different types of data and analyse it in the same way, which was really, really helpful because a lot of um, interpretive frameworks say, well, this is how you do interviews, or this is how you do you know, digital data. And I needed something that I could put in, whether it was packaging from a pork pie shop or field notes from making a collage and interpret it all together. Um, obviously, you don't necessarily need to know the detail of this, but um, what you do is you write codes, which are like little summaries of um, all the elements of the data, and then you build them up together into memos and then you start to create theories. So it's quite nice because you don't start with a theory or a hypothesis that you go out to prove. You build that from the data, which if you are starting out and feeling really lost, is quite encouraging because it's supposed to be how you feel. With the collage, one of the reasons obviously I gave it to you was just because I thought it would be fun. But also it reflected some of the weirdness of trying to be an ethnographer when you feel like an archaeologist, you've come to a conference and I've given you sweets, so it's just weird. There's a lot of feeling a little bit out of place and feeling like you don't belong when you work with other disciplines, I think. Um, but also when um, using it as a metaphor, it's lovely because you, when you overlap different pieces of paper and different colours of um, cellophane, and they are biodegradable, for God's history, by the way, you get new colours appearing. It's not that you just have a blue piece and a red piece and they stay together as separate 
colours, you get to see new things entirely. And I thought that was a really useful <coughs> representation of my experience with interdisciplinary research, is that it opens up your thinking, gives you completely new ideas that you wouldn't otherwise have had. But also, fundamentally, it can be quite messy. So this is, oops, this is the one I made last week. It is rubbish. It's clear that I have no natural ability in collage. It looks like a four-year-old has made it. Um, and actually, <laughs> it won't necessarily work to just pick up different methods. It might be like my early interviews where I thought, gosh, these people are really, really boring and they're a bit to tell me. Um, it can be really messy. And part of what you need to do is, I suppose, keep going with it. Um, <laughs> And I think that that's why we'll wrap up. Thank you very much.